Good morning. Everybody, great conversation. I hate to interrupt, but it is nine o'clock. Um, so we'll get going. Try to be cognizant of everybody's time. And I know you got a lot of stuff going on. So I'd just like to start off by saying thanks for coming. Um, we're excited to have everybody here. I know um, it's maybe a little different form than what we've seen in the past, talking about broadband and things like that. Um, so we came to that um, as we talked in the office and we travel many places and hear about economic development and what other communities are doing. So we just wanted to create a forum in which that could happen locally. And uh, we're excited to have all of you here. You all been involved in your communities and promoting them and developing them and getting everybody to work together. So it's a really exciting time and um, we just wanna be part of it and bring everybody together. So I'd like to start by saying thank you. I um, really appreciate everybody being here. Um, and really looking forward to our speakers and panelists sharing their time and talents with us. So we'll get started here shortly. Um, today marks the first ever Connected Community Summit in Northeast Iowa. Um, we're really proud to be hosting this event um, and excited to have you here once again. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Sarah for all of her efforts to plan, coordinate, and ensure that this got going. <laughs> so thanks, Sarah. So the purpose, I kind of touched on the purpose a little bit, but really I want everybody to leave here today with a, knowing that we communicated, identified, and leveraged what a valuable resource broadband can be to all of our communities. Um, it's really important in the business environment, healthcare, education, telecommuting, quality of life. I have some realtors in the audience. I'm sure some of the questions folks get asked are, hey, does it have a good broadband connection? So. Um, it really is an important aspect of, of where we're going and where we're going to be. Um, and it, hopefully everybody leaves with new connections, new relationships, knowledge, and some enthusiasm um, to help their communities thrive as we move, move into the future. So I don't want you to listen to me too much. We've got a great group of moderators and panelists here. They have a lot more value to offer than I do. So um, the lineups you should have in your folders. Uh, there's an agenda in there. Speaker bios are in the back, so I won't spend much time on the bios. You can read those at your, at your leisure. So we'll start with Ron Kresha um, with the Golden Shovel Agency. I think he's been around showing some of his virtual reality that they've been doing and how they're promoting communities that they work with. So it's exciting. Um, that will be followed by an innovators panel, uh, and that will be moderated by Bill Menner of the Bill Menner Group. He's sitting in back there by Mark. Uh, so that'll be good, and then we'll come with a connectors panel, and Ron Kresher will um, moderate that. And then we'll have a roundtable luncheon, and at that time, there's some questions on a placard. If you just want to, just for people to talk, right, it's discussion points about how broadband makes a difference um, as we go. So th that's, that's good. Spend time on, take notes, share with us. We'll be wandering around. So if you have any questions for me or Sarah or any Alpine folks, they have Alpine gear on, um, just ask us. All right, um, we're available to help in any way that we can. So with that, thanks for listening to me ramble and I'll turn it over to Ron. So let's welcome Ron. So I hope you can hear me okay. I, I'm originally, I, I'm a, a teacher as well by trade, but I, I know when I'm in large groups that the microphone helps you hear me so, and it doesn't allow me to shout. So first of all, I just wanna thank Alpine. I wanna thank Sarah and Chris for having me um, I was fortunate enough to speak at the a National Telecom Association, and that's where Chris and I believe Chuck saw me. Um, and I, I flew in, was able to talk, a, at that point we were talking about workforce attraction and some of the, what we're seeing with the modern workforce. So I'll talk a little bit about that today as well as uh, what we're seeing in trends in economic development. And certainly going to talk about why broadband is important and all of that. I'll give you a little bit of my background. So I originally come from Nebraska. Um, a town of Columbus, and from there I, I moved up to Minnesota, went to college and stayed there, and thankfully Minnesota is playing Nebraska and we're not playing Iowa, so I can stay away from all the bad jokes today. Uh, so that, that's my background there. After I graduated from college, I was a teacher, uh, taught in rural Ivanhoe in southwest Minnesota, town of 800, and I, I landed that first teaching job in 93, which um, if many of you remember, that's when dial-up was just starting to happen. And so we were fighting hard to get dial-up in the, in the town that I was in. And as an English teacher and a young teacher, that was really liberating for us to be able to connect to our classroom outside. From there, I moved into central Minnesota, 
and I took a job as a technology coordinator uh, because I was young and I knew how to wire things. And that's really what happened back in the schools in the 90s was if you were um, innovative enough and could learn how to wire, you were wiring a school. So if anybody remembers back then, we used to have uh, Saturday wire days where I would get a whole bunch of students and volunteers and we'd come in with a whole box or a whole set of Cat5 boxes and we'd start pulling fiber or we'd start pulling copper. And then eventually I became Cisco certified. And so, yes, I do know the seven layers of the OSI model, if there's anybody in here that's of that geek nature. And uh, I am familiar with uh, being a router jock and a switch and programming and all that. But it taught me really how to connect schools. And at that time, we were taking our school and connecting it outside of, uh, to, the, to the rural communities. From there, I left and I started an online learning company called Atomic Learning. And what that really was about was, as a network technician and a technology person, I was always answering questions about how do you center in Microsoft Word? How do you print? How do you do this? And so we started creating videos. We put those online. We started a company. And we did that in Little Falls, Minnesota. And I left that company. Uh, th that company went on. When I left, it was 65 employees and international. And when I left, I realized the power of broadband connection and rural communities. And that really started to click with me because we started a really innovative international company in central Minnesota, a town of 8,000. So I left that and I started Golden Shovel with this idea that rural America really needed to have some help when it came to marketing because we were competing with these metro areas that had these budgets and had these marketing companies, but we had just as much opportunity and we had just as much to offer a business or a workforce but we just weren't telling our story very well. So that's how Golden Shovel uh, was started. Um, and I was in Golden Shovel, we were running that, I ran that company for four years and I decided, you know, things weren't moving fast enough. So I'm gonna run for the state legislature because that'll really get things moving. So that's what I did. So then I ran for the state legislature. Uh, I became elected, that was eight years ago, and went down to St. Paul with this idea that I was gonna change the world. Well, happy to say, it. Uh, some things happened. It moved a lot slower than I thought it was going to, but I was able to really get into broadband. And in Minnesota, we became one of the leaders in broadband legislation. Uh, we were lucky enough to secure over $100 million in, in six years of challenge grant, our competitive grants that went out to help communities. And that really helped push a lot of our areas in, in rural Minnesota along, getting them connected. And all of that tied together now is coming back to what I'm going to talk about today, which is I believe there's a rural resurgence coming. When I look at the data, and I've done lots of studies on workforce, and you start to look at the new, new workforce out there, you can call them the millennials, or you can use whatever ge uh, generation with a letter behind it. But looking at those workers and how they're going to migrate, we find a lot of things. But the rural resurgence is real. They're coming back, and they will come. They're migrating right now. And workers and businesses are seeking prosperity. They're looking for opportunities. Telecommunication, broadband, um, that is going to be one of the things that's going to drive them there. Um, and as I started to look at this, one of the things that I came across was this idea in, uh, believe it or not, in plants and uh, biology called an edge. And it, it won't be an unfamiliar term to you, but it started to work for me in economic development. And there's this idea of an edge where when two ecosystems come together, on that edge is where you're going to see your most diversity and you're going to see the most life. So if you have two, let's say you have a water marsh coming into a forest. It's along that edge that life really starts to thrive. And as I started to study this and think about it, I thought, this is exactly what's happening with communities. You start to see these rural bumping into the urban, bumping into the metro, and it's along those edges we need to start looking for where are the workers, where is the diversity, and who's moving where. So as I study these edges more, and it uh, just happens to have that I have five kids all in that millennial age, and I could use them uh, as well to kind of validate some of these theories, but what I found is these migration of workers, if you can think of edges of communities, they're moving along those edges. They're moving from, I can use the analogy in Minnesota, they're moving from our community of Little Falls, they're moving to St. Cloud, which is about 100,000, then they're moving to St. Paul, Minneapolis, and from there, they're being sucked away to Atlanta and Denver, and they're following the trends of technology and the economy. 
Well, they're now starting to look for ways to migrate back because of the cost of living and the rent and the housing is pushing them away from a couple of things. They can't afford to pay their student loans off and the housing is so expensive. And so they're starting to come back this way and we need to start looking at those edges and we need to understand, like vegetation, communities have a core strategy and an edge strategy. Now I want you to think about that. Think about your community. What's a core strategy? A core strategy is where you put out a nice economic development website that talks about your heritage days, or it talks about the parades that you have, or it talks about the festivities. Those are great core strategies and keep your residents happy so they know what's going on, but it's not doing much to attract the folks on the edges because they're, they're not coming for your parades, they're not coming for your heritage days, they're coming for your opportunity. What's your housing look like? What does your school look like? What does your medical look like? What, how quickly can I connect to an internet when I come to your town? Those are the types of things that we see on the edge, and that's what we see with these, uh, these new workforce. Like vegetation, change happens at the edge. And I can't repeat that enough wherever I go. Change happens at the edge. And it's the most comfortable spot to live, right? Uh, if you think about the edge of all of our lives, the most uncomfortable place to be is out there. But that's where we have to be looking for these new workers. And I, I say this wherever I go, and uh, no exception, look around the room today. Uh, there's not a lot of diversity here. Um, we have the male, female, we may have some age stuff, but we don't see some of the diversity that's coming in behind us on the edges of the tat you know, the kids with the tattoos, the, the different colors, the different races, they're there. And they're looking to move into communities that are ready to welcome them. And they're very intelligent, they're very smart, they're entrepreneurs, but we have to find a way to have inclusion strategies and welcome them. And again, this is all on the edge. And it took me a while to, you know, I, I'll be honest, I'm a, I'm a midlife white guy with, with a son and four daughters who tends to be very judgmental about the boys that come to my house. And I certainly am judgmental about the girls that come to my house. So none of them should get married, but yet they need to give me grandkids, right? I'm not sure how we're going to get there. But as they've started to grow up and as I, you know, I've started to see the different ways that they work, I started to understand these edge workers and these modern workers a bit, and which is what we put into economic development strategies when we work with communities. Let me give you a couple of examples. Smartphones. Um, we all know they're... Uh, popular and we know how well they're used. A couple of examples that woke me up on how important that smartphone is. When my daughter started applying for college, um, she's a senior now in college, um, my wife and I were just, mainly my wife, I'll throw her under the bus, she's not here. Um, she was really on my daughter, you've got to get your college application and you've got to get this done, you've got to apply to these colleges. And we were coming through her junior year into her senior year, and she was never sitting at the computer, she was never doing these applications, she was never doing this stuff. So my wife and I are assuming she's not applying for college, right? She's not doing this. And of course that's frustrating because my wife is very much a type A, I'm ADHD. I can see her and me going, ah, she's gonna do it, honey, don't worry, it'll be last minute. And my wife's like, no, this needs to be done, it needs to be done now, and we need to start doing this. So we were driving actually on our way to La Crosse, Wisconsin, and uh, we're driving in the van, and my wife and I are sitting out in the front row, and my wife, of course, we're talking about this. Why isn't she applying for college? What's going on? And my daughter is sitting behind us, and all of a sudden she says, I'm done. My wife says, what? She said, yeah, I got three applications done. I got all of my essays done. She's been doing it all on her Apple, at that time an Apple iPhone 5. And I started to realize, all right, this is what this workforce does. This is the computer of their generation. And as you start to study this and you look in uh, homes that have a, low, uh, have a high poverty, that's probably the most powerful computer in their family. So we had to, it was, a, it was a huge shift for me to realize, okay, we have to make sure that we're gearing up for these phones and how these kids and these workers are using it. Now she's a senior in college. These kids are using these phones even more. I mean, we're using them. So what did this mean for communities and economic development? And when I work with employers, one of the first things, and I'll challenge this group is, how many of you have applied for a job on your phone for your business? And can you do it in five minutes? There's my millennial. You can do it in five minutes? Good for you. The power of what you did to find 
you know, and use the internet to get there. Now take that to this edge. I mean, I would consider you absolutely an edge person. On the edge, you know, you're, you're using these technologies and these tools. And so I'll go back to, I asked the question, how many of you have applied? One hand went up. If you run a company or you have, uh, you know people that are looking for workers and you keep hearing them say, we can't find workers, Ask them to pull their phone out and apply for a job right there on the spot. If they can't do it, think of all the people they're missing. Because that's how these workers are applying for jobs now. As they're sitting in line at the grocery store, they're applying for jobs or they're looking for them. And if they can't get to you on their phone, they're not coming. I hate to tell you that, they're not coming. And too often I will go to a website, or someone will ask me to look at their website, and I'll look at it, and I pull my phone out, and they're like, well, don't you use your phone. It doesn't look good. I said, well, guess what? You don't look good. Because it's not me that you're trying to impress. It's the young lady here that just spoke up. It's the kids that are coming out of college. This is their life. And they want to apply, but they want to do it on their phone. They want to do it on their terms. And that's the next part about this, when you think about the modern workforce. This is why broadband is so important, and one of the reasons we push so hard for it, and I know Iowa's been pushing, but in the legislature I pushed for it, is I said, you have to remember the world is on their terms now, it's not on ours. At a 2.9% unemployment rate, we, we don't have the control we have anymore. Um, there's a stat out there, the Pew Research, that says 79% of the people that are working are actively looking for jobs while they're working, which means while they're sitting working for you, they are wondering where they can go next. And they'll go. They don't care, especially if you're in that age group. And you, I mean, think about it. If you are 25 to 32 years old without a family but a bunch of student loan debt, your biggest worries are how am I paying my student loan and how am I paying my rent? It's a math problem. And I can figure it out on my phone while I'm on the job that you're paying me for. That's the world we're in today. So we have to turn that around a bit. So when you think about the modern workforce, it's on their terms. We have to go to them. We have to go to the edges. They know more about, it used to be, because I was in hiring, it used to be we knew more about them than they knew about us. It's not that way anymore. They know more about me as a company than I know about them as a worker. Because they will do their homework, they'll do their research, and they will find out, are you a good fit for me Whereas we used to think as employers, you should just be happy I'm giving you a job. My goodness, how many times have I said that to my kids at home? You should just be happy to be mowing the lawn and getting a dollar. Well, now we take that to the corporate world. We're like, you should be happy I'm giving you a job. Not the new modern workforce. They are saying, you should be happy I'm coming to you. And I want the culture. I want this. And they just start running through the benefits. Not that it's a bad thing, because one of the things that I hear all these stories about millennials and the work, modern workforce, and a lot of people say to me, oh my gosh, these, these kids aren't loyal, they just will leave, I, I don't, they're not going to be on time. They, they can run through all these things. That's not what the research says about them. We, I mean, there are certain things about them, but the research also says this about modern workforce. If they believe in your company vision, they'll be more loyal to stay with you. They have to believe your company is more, or your community, both of them, synonymous terms, are more about social change than they are profit. The modern workforce today cares more about the environment than whether or not your company is going to make a profit. And they will stick with you if they know that you care socially. Let me give an example from my own daughter. So uh, she was interning two years ago. Uh, and she was looking at this company to intern for HR. That's the field she's in. And she said, I really like this company, Dad. I said, well, tell me, what do you like about it? She says, well, you know, when I go into the break room, they don't use any straws. Now, full disclosure, I, I come from a conservative Catholic background. Our home is pretty, you can imagine the conservative talks that we have. So I, have now, I now have a 20-year-old daughter telling me she doesn't like straws. Now, I hunt and fish with, with a crazy passion, and she's worried about saving mammals in the ocean with straws. Fine, okay, so there might be a little bit of a disconnect between her and her dad. But I'm a good dad, I'm gonna listen. So I said, okay, so you, you're telling me you like this company because they don't use plastic straws. She says, no, yeah, those are bad for the environment, dad. I said, well, 
okay, so tell me what the company does. It's a defense contractor. So I said, all right, let me get this straight, honey. You are enjoying interning there. You love it because you go to the break room because they don't use straws. But the products they make, yeah, she didn't care. She didn't care. But it's funny because as I go through, that's what I see in, in this modern workforce. And it also translates to your community. When I talk to modern workforces and when I talk to workers moving in or we do economic development studies, they will tell us, I don't just want to come in, I don't want to just live in the community, and I don't want to just have a job. I want to know how I'm going to have the opportunity to donate my time, what social causes are you, and, and every community does it. Every community has them. It could be environmental issues, it could be working with uh, uh, poverty, it could be inclusion for diversity. So you need to celebrate those and tell the workers that are coming, here's your opportunity outside of work. And as I said, if your modern workers believe in your company vision and they believe you're doing things other than profit, they're going to be more likely to stay and less likely to leave. So those, those are a couple of facts about the modern workforce that we've learned. Um, more, more technology savvy. Oh, the other thing is, and, and you probably know this, the modern workers, they don't want to jump through hoops. Um, they will do it on their time. If you have a lengthy job application that they have to go through, you're going to lose them. It's just like lead generation. Get them in the door and then start working your prospects. Um, job seekers today move on quickly, very, very quickly. Um, I, I had a chance to look at all of your communities online a little bit, and I looked at, at some of the businesses. I did it with my phone, and, uh, you know, as we all run into, and I see these, there are lots of opportunities for me to get frustrated and just move on. One of the things that I run into a lot of, and we helped a community in, in uh, South Dakota, was child care. So now a young family is going to look at your community. Maybe they're a young professional. One of the first things on their mind is child care. What's, what's the child care situation? So what we did is we put that front and center for their, uh, their community website, and then we put phone numbers on there. Why? Because as whether the husband or the wife or the partner or whoever is, just, is scrolling through there and looking for a child care, they could click on a number right away because that phone's in their hand, their thumb's going to move over. But if they look at it and they've got to go look it up, they've got to go look in another area, they're, not, they're, not gonna, they're just not going to do that. Time for them is, is so much different than, than how other people see it. So making sure that you can just click on a phone number and get right to them. Same thing with community leaders. All the websites and everyone that we work with, we make sure your phone numbers and your emails are on the web page or on the contact so that I can click with my phone and I, 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 would, I would be super wealthy if I had a dollar for everyone that said, but the telemarketers are going to call me or they're going to get spammed. Yeah, but so are workers. And it's a trade-off. You can hang up on telemarketers, but you don't want to hang up on the workers. Because they're going to be looking, and they're looking for that information, they're looking for it quickly, and you need to be able to respond to them. Um, Another study that we did, what we found out is when uh, workers are looking for your community and they're looking at your, uh, your business, here are the things they're going to look at before they even contact you. They want to know the job details. What's this going to be like? What's the salary range? What's the company overview? Uh, that is very important to them. They want to know, and, and we talk a lot about videos, they want to know beforehand, what is it going to be like when I walk in there on day one? Um, I won't say the modern workforce or, or many of the young workers that I see are right or wrong on this, but they have this I can learn it attitude. They've grown up on YouTube. They've grown up on this. For them, they're, they're going to say, get me in. Let me see if I like the company, and I'll learn very, very quickly. And they will. We still have to guide them through and, and, and run them through onboarding and training. But in their mind, they have grown up in a culture of, I will learn it. I will learn it. I'll give you an example, another one from my, my family. Uh, my son, who's in the Air Force, when he left high school, um, the, uh, and I was an, I'm an English teacher by trade, he couldn't put a sentence together, and he had no idea what subject and verb agreements were. If I walked into a bathroom and I, thought, I saw things misspelled, you know, the profanity, I knew exactly who did it. Because that was his skill set. 
God love him. I love the kid. He went off to the Air Force, went to college, everything online, and now is going and applying to be an MBA lawyer. All of that learning, grammar, composition, all that, he learned on his own online. I didn't think he could do it because I was kind of dumb about it. I'm like, no, you got to learn it the traditional way I did. You got to go through. No, no. He learned it online. He self-taught himself. And I see that so often with kids his age. That's just how they learn. They will go YouTube it. They'll, they will learn this on their own. They'll use Grammarly. If you're not using Grammarly, by the way, install that puppy on your computer today. Because I thought I could write, and then I put Grammarly on, and I am an idiot. Because we type so fast. But little tools like that, use them, because the kids are using them. And, and so I go back to, that's what this modern workforce is. They're going to come into your door not worried about what they don't know because they believe they can get there, but they're more worried about what the world is going to be like around them. So just a couple of things to think about when you think about the modern workforce. Company culture is very, very big for them. And then your company mission. So a couple of things to think about for the next generation. Um, these are the top five things that I see in our research has shown that the modern workforce is looking for. When they come into a new opportunity or a new town, number one, and that's why I'm here at your broadband, connectivity. That is their lifeline. That is their, that's their oxygen. And I'm sure many of you have kids uh, like I do, and when their friends come over, what's the first thing they want to know? What's the Wi-Fi password? Yep. So connectivity, and, and, it, and it's no different for your communities. So if, if connectivity is the number one reason why people will move to your community, why aren't any communities putting it on their websites? Why aren't any communities talking about it? And, and uh, you know, some of the communities I come from are just as guilty, and I tell them, we all love the craft fair that happens in Little Falls that draws a whole bunch of people here. We love it dearly. But quit putting it on the front page of the website, because the people that are coming already know about it. Let's get those young professionals or young families to come here because of the broadband connection, and then guess what, while they're here, they're going to go to the craft fair because it brings 50,000 people. They can't avoid it. So connectivity, talk about that. And I, I, whenever I talk to, I'm sure Chris would echo this and Sarah, you've got to push that connectivity and push the areas that have it and talk about how you're working towards getting there. And I, when I talk to my legislative friends, and it's crazy, many of the legislative people that I know down in St. Paul will say, well, I don't really need to have broadband in northern Minnesota because, you know, I'm not downloading x-rays or anything like that. I'm just getting emails and, oh, and it, how many of you have heard this? People are just using it for Netflix anyway. That's not what's going on. And if it is, be, let it. I mean, if, if you're going to come and watch Netflix in your community and pay taxes, God bless you. I'll give you Amazon Prime too. Maybe you'll pay more taxes. But think about that. You know, a lot of people are using this as an excuse. But let's talk about what broadband's really bring into our communities. Um, telehealth. We're headed in, in Minnesota, and, I'm sh and I see it in every other state, rural health care is in trouble. It's expensive, it's hard, and people are having a hard time paying those medical bills. But with broadband connections and being able to wire right to the home and drive those costs down, we're going to see people stay in their homes longer, we're going to see more health care benefits, and we're going to see people staying in their communities instead of having to move closer to a medical facility. Broadband connection, that's not Netflix. I mean, sure, I want to watch my episode of whatever show, but I also want to make sure that my heart monitor is working back to the doctor. And we need to tell people about that. And, and that telemedicine is, is, is huge. The second thing, Activism. I can't, I can't stress this enough. Activism. And I love my kids. I love them to death. And they don't see the world like I do, which is good, because I, I get educated a lot. But they care a lot about different things that I didn't, and I'm learning from them. 
But one of the things I tell community leaders is you have to listen to them too because they are your potential. They are your future generation. You may not see their activism about straws or the environment the same way they do, but guess what? They're entitled to making your community their community just as much as we did to our communities. So open up a little bit and listen because they want that. And you know what? It's not a bad thing. If they come in and they want to you know, be on the activism side and really help with what's going on with the homeless in central Minnesota, you know, we shouldn't push back on that. But I, I see too many communities that are afraid to have that conversation or afraid to talk to the new modern workforce and recruit them for those activities. They really, really care about that stuff. And good for them. It's great for our communities. So connectivity, activism, those are two of the top things. This thing's gonna kill me, isn't it? I, if you can tell I'm ADHD, I just, I'll just take this with me. Opportunity is the third thing they're looking for. And what's the number one thing on most of their minds? How do I pay my student loans off? Because they've come out, they've been told you're gonna get this degree and you're gonna, they've been told about education and I'm not saying it's not smart, because you know, my kids are doing the same thing. And, and you look at the numbers of getting a college degree or a technical degree versus no degree at all, but they want to know how am I going to pay this off and be able to pay for rent and housing. What they're not asking yet is how am I going to have kids? Because those other two things are taking precedent. So talk to them when you promote your communities and your businesses about that, how the low cost of living is going to help them make more towards their principal payment of their student loans, how the low commute is going to help them with the carbon footprint so they'll feel better about being there. Why not? I mean, these are great things that we have in rural Minnesota and rural Iowa to talk about. If you're a teleworker, I'm sorry, if you're a teleworker, Think of what you were doing on the carbon footprint. It's phenomenal, why not promote that? I can tell you the Europeans are all over this. Because we, we work with a lot of foreign direct investment and when the Europeans start looking at where they're gonna invest, one of the things they're wondering is, how do we reduce our carbon footprint? In other words, how do we not fly around so much because every time they get in a plane, it's adding to the, the carbon footprint. These are just things they think about. So opportunity, flexibility is the fourth thing that they talk about, that the modern workforce talks about, or looks at. Don't tie me down. They don't, want, they don't want stuff. They don't care. Give me a small place to live, I can pack everything in my little Prius and away I go. That's fine. I know that's an overbroad generalization, but for the most part, they don't want stuff like we do, you know? When I grew up, I wanted acreage and I wanted outbuildings and I wanted all of this stuff because that for me was freedom. And when I now look at my kids and go, you know, freedom really is just having a Rubbermaid and a, a phone that I can connect. That, that's, that's freedom. So talk about how your community can do that. Talk about that opportunity and that flexibility. One of the things that I, uh, and when you talk about flexibility and opportunity, they don't mind driving 30, 40, 50 miles to go, to, an, to, to go experience culture and arts and craft breweries and those tours. They also like to come back where it's quiet, where they can telecommute. So talk about that. Talk about that. Security. And, and it's not a house. Um, they just wanna be able to pay their bills. They want have an internet connection. They wanna know that they have some opportunity for growth. They're not really worried about health care or retirement. Can you guess why? Because they know who's going to solve it. It's going to be the government. In their lifetime, something will happen with retirement or health care that's, that's going to solve those problems. I don't know what it's going to be now, but I can, I'm just looking at the winds of it. They, my, my kid's generation, um, and maybe a little bit older, they really believe that's coming. And it may be, I, I can't say that it is or it isn't, I won't, I won't get into that politically, but I will say that a solution will have to probably come up to at least bridge those, make some compromises or bridge some of those gaps. So, now let's talk about what I saw when I looked at your communities. 
Uh, Sarah was kind enough to share with me the communities that are represented here. And I'm going to try to say this in a way that you don't throw me out of, out of here. But here's what I found when I looked at your communities online. I'm not going to name communities, but these were the general things. Now remember, connectivity, activism, opportunity, flexibility, and security. That's what's attracting the modern workforce. That's what's attracting uh, entrepreneurs. That's what you're looking for. Here's the top things that I found. I don't even know if I want to say these. And I don't mean it in a bad way. You're doing, I mean, you're representing who you are. You're representing many good things and heritage that comes from your communities. But remember, I'm trying to convince you to think about the edge for a second. We have a river and we like it. That was one of the messages that came loud and clear through a couple of communities. We have a river and we like it. Okay, so think about your son, daughter, if you have them or a grandkid. How is that going to get them to your community? We like visitors. Let me say that again. We like visitors. What are you saying to these kids and these workers on the edge when you make visitors your primary goal? We all want tourism, right? We all want you to come to Little, I want you to come to Little Falls, stay there for three nights, come to, you know, just dump a bucket load of money and leave. That's what we're saying. We are historic and we like our history. Okay? Shouldn't, it's not that you shouldn't be proud of that, but remember, we're talking about the next generation. We're talking about the next workforce, and they want just as much opportunity to, to define what that community is going to look like as the, as the generations before them. They're coming to your community not for what it is today, but what it will be tomorrow. So when we talk about the great things in history, which is, is good, we should talk about that historical context. Are we opening, are we saying, this is our history and we're proud of it and we don't want to change, which is why we like visitors? Or are we saying, this is our history and the long way that we've gotten here and the successful people and you can be one of them? Which message are we saying and using? Please don't use this word. I see it all the time. We're quaint. What does it mean? It means something to you. It, I guarantee you, if you go to the local coffee shop, people love to say, we have this quaint little community. Let me tell you what quaint means to me. It means I'm sitting at my grandmother's house with her checkered apron, and she says, it's a quaint life we have here. To the people on the edge, they're not looking for Queen anymore. Lots of great, there's 450,000 great words in the English language. Quaint is not one you should use when you're talking to these people on the edge. Oh, and we like visitors. I, I bring it up again because guess what? I saw it multiple times. Oh, we like visitors. Be careful with that message. And, and I don't, you know, I know this is, um, oh, here's the last one, then I'll stop on the. We have long roads that you should try. Or we have this long trail. I think some of you know which ones I'm talking about, some of you know. So we like visitors and we have this super long road that you should try. Where in that does it say, come raise a family in our town? What it says is, is, Come try this long road, and thanks for stopping. These kids and the, 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 this modern workforce, they're so transient, they don't care. So you really have to be aggressive. Now, where do we get this from? And I, you know, I, I, this may sound harsh, or may, but I work with lots of communities. We just came out of Haiti. Um, we did a, a Haiti economic development. You talk about toughest of the tough economic messages to get through. But once you get through all of the, the horrible things that have happened at the government level, all the poverty, you find there's a, a layer of incredible productivity that's coming in hardworking people, and we told their story. The reason I bring this forward to you is, let's tell your story of success. Let's talk about the young people and entrepreneurs that have come 
started. They still share your common values. They maybe still have your culture ingrained in them. But they're stepping out of the boundaries and they're successful. Tell that story. Because those are powerful. One of the, one of the best uh, marketing initiatives that we helped the community with uh, was called 30 Under 30. They, we found a month that had 30 days in it. And we went out and every day, we did it the month before because obviously we want to be prepared. But we, we would take our phones, they would take their phones and they'd go find a young entrepreneur or a young business person um, or medical professional, uh, um, someone from the medical that moved in, shoot a quick 30 second video. Why are you here? They talked about it, and then every day for 30 days, we would post one of these. It was incredibly effective because they started sharing it with their peers, other people started to see it. More importantly, the people on the edge started to say, oh, I could be successful there. That's when you know your message is working, is when you hear these edge people saying, I could be successful there. I can see myself there, because that's what we're shooting for. That's what we're shooting for when we talk about these. How am I doing on time? Does that mean like I should stop or I can keep going? Or? Oh, perfect. Okay, so I've got a couple more comments and I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, talk about your success stories. Um, before I go, yeah, so perfect. This will take me now where I want to go. So when you, now we know that edges exist. Think about in terms of edges. Think about how you're going out to that edge, how you're trying to uh, attract those people. Now, flip that a little bit and think about what your competitive edge is as a community or as a school. Because you have one. And go after the people that you most think will be successful in your community. Too often I see communities businesses, they, they just market to everybody. No, don't do that. Figure out who's coming. Figure out, get that specific message, figure out who is successful in your community and then push that message. Talk about your broadband. Talk about all of that because you have competitive advantages. You have the lowest cost of living probably. You have the best commute times. You have low crime. You have great family places. I suspect, and I, you know, maybe not talk about that Heritage Day or, or your town festivals on the front page of your web page, but talk about that later under your arts area about what happens when I'm there. And one of the things that many, many communities miss is talking about their local artists. We all have them. And one of the, one of the things that I remind people, like in Little Falls, we do um, a rock in the park every year. And somebody asked, they're like, well, why is that important? I said, because when the community comes together and the local artists that are really talented can show their stuff, rather than having to drive and show them to other communities, it brings us all together as neighbors and we start talking about those things that we don't talk about on social media that divide us. We start talking about how we like each other versus who we're voting for and communities start to come together and band. So, a couple, couple things to think about. Now, if you've had a chance to look at the virtual reality, and I'll, I'll have this all day, you're, you're welcome to try these. I, some people had a chance to try it. So, I go back to my earliest days of being an, uh, an acne 14 year old who didn't leave his basement. And I, I realized the reason I had acne was because I never turned the lights on and the bacteria was probably growing. Um, but I loved playing with the computer, and I loved getting on the internet back then, and I loved all this technology. And now that this virtual reality has come, I'll, I'll be honest, like five, six, I mean, it's been around for a long time. Virtual reality has been around for a long time, even back to when people were putting full-headed boxes on us. So we've always wondered, is this going to play? Now with bandwidth, this has taken on amazing, amazing possibilities. Let me tell you about a couple. We use this for economic development um, with communities. What we do is we'll go into a community, we'll shoot, the entire community will tell their story, and what communities are always trying to do is get people to come to their communities. Hey, come, if, I hear this a lot. If I could just get you to my downtown, you'll move here. If I can just show you the community, you'll like it. Well, to get a whole bunch of site selectors or business people to do that, that's pretty expensive. 
And we now, many communities that we work with, they're shooting a virtual reality video and they're sending these with their community brand on it to them. And the cool thing is, so I wear the goggles in Little Falls, for example. A site selector in New York puts the goggles on and a business owner in Little Falls or maybe somewhere else puts it on and we now connect in a virtual room and I bring our community up and I start walking you through it. Maybe I can get you interested. If I can get you interested enough to fly out, now it's economical for both of us rather than me trying to fly 15 people out and hoping one of them will use it. That's one thing that's happening. So we started doing this for communities. And by the way, this is entirely dependent on bandwidth. One more, one more reason why bandwidth is important. So then we started using this in communities and, and people started coming to us saying, you know, I'm having a really hard time recruiting doctors to our hospital in rural Minnesota. Well, why is that? Well, we just can't get them out here to visit. So, and these are, these are hospitals that have put up great new additions with wonderful technology. So they're shooting virtual reality and they're using it for doctor and nurse recruitment. They're sending the, and, and then colleges started to get on board. And so we started working with colleges and the colleges figured out, you know what, I can do this and I can send these into high schools. And when kids go sit down with their guidance counselor, they get to experience our campus. And oh, by the way, they get to experience the campus when we control the weather and when we can control all the imagery. Not when they show up and hope that it's not snowing or raining or whatever. So they, they get to control that story, which is so very, very important. A couple of other things that you're going to see virtual reality doing. I talked about telemedicine. Senior homes are really moving into virtual reality. Why? Because many of the senior citizens, the residents are there, are not able to travel like they used to, and they are using virtual reality to give senior citizens or residents in these long dementia and Alzheimer patients. It's amazing because they can put them in environments and peaceful situations that they might not otherwise experience just being confined to that, to that home. Surgeons, training for surgeons, job training, manufacturers. We, when I told you about the culture, I told you that modern workers want to know what it's like to work there. They love virtual reality. They love on their phone to be able to look at uh, a manufacturer or a light manufacturer and say, that's what it's like to work there. And again, can I see myself there? Um, uh, lots of applications for this. I, I, five years ago, I would have said, that's ah, a gaming thing. Not anymore. And I put, I'll tell you what, I put this on. We got our first set. We started playing with this. I put this on three years ago. And two thoughts hit me. This is amazing. And oh my God, what's it going to do for our society? Because I thought it was pretty cool. And I could, quit, I could pretty quickly see myself watching sports venues in my chair while my wife is 10 feet away. And I'm happy. Because I got, it looks like I've got the whole theater to myself. But again, my wife is 10 feet away and we're not interacting. And then my kids put it on and they love the games right away. And you can see them getting sucked in. So the double side to the virtual reality is it's coming. I can't stop it but how do we control it? I don't think we're headed to a dystopia where I'm certainly hoping we're, we're not headed to this world where people stop going outside and enjoy their outdoor activities in lieu of this, but we should leverage the technology and the broadband because there's one thing we know is we can't control what the consumers are going to be attracted to. You have to give, give the masses what they want. And the nice thing about virtual reality is, and I, I'll, I'll close with this and then I'll take your questions, communities need to tell your story. Control that story, because if you do not tell your story, somebody else will. Think about the peer reviews for anything you do. How many of you, when you buy something, you look at it, and then you start to go through the reviews to see what other people say about it? Yeah, that will formulate how you think about that. Same thing with your community. Tell your stories. Have your success stories. Use video. Tell your story have people validate that with peer reviews and share it on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that, and tell the right story, because you have it. You have it. But we in the Midwest, we're kind of shy. We, you know, we, we've grown up with this humble, yeah, I don't really want to talk about myself. Uh, those days are gone. You have to talk about yourself, because Atlanta, Denver, uh, the coast, they don't care. They're going to keep sucking away our workers if we don't, if we don't go after them.
So there you go. That's, uh, that's the end of my formal spiel. Um, I would love to take some questions and uh, hear from you. So the question was, um, or what your comments were, you're, you're targeting tourists, uh, which a lot of us do. I don't want to say you shouldn't. How do you change that? A couple of ways you can do it. Um, you, can ch you can have different landing pages. The main way is take a step back and ask yourself, who do I want to attract? First of all, yes, you do want to attract tourists. Don't walk away from here saying, do not go after the tourists. But you need to simultaneously go after the workforce. And you can do that by launching separate campaigns. Like what we would do is we would create your tourism campaign to talk about all the great things that you can do in your community. But we'd also launch a specific workforce and business attraction campaign and go after them. One, and one thing, I'll give you a, a one, I'll give you a couple quick things you can do. First of all, how many of you post on Facebook once a week or once a day? Why not 10 times a day? Are you saying you do? Yes, repost and repost. Because remember, you're not on Facebook all day. So the reason I say this is, let's say you create a workforce attraction post and you create a tourism post, run them all day long simultaneously because you don't know who you're going to catch. And too often people post once on one topic forgetting that your audience is going to be all over the place. So direct them and then with your website you can have the tourism side direct them to there you can have the workforce attraction direct them there don't direct them to your home page in a generic fashion be very purposeful about it have a success story so like for example you can have uh, maybe your bed and breakfast talk about the great things that they're doing for tourism and have them posting and other people liking and sharing that and then have somebody talk about their success story and have those go to two, two different locations. Write two different blogs. You, you just have to, exp I, too often we're, we're too generic, if that, mean, if that helps. Be very purposeful. And remember, you know, people are going to click on your website. They're maybe going to go to three pages. They're not going to go explore your entire website that first time through. So I see the post on a job opening. I click on it. Now I go to your website. I, I check it out. Maybe I'll come back later and look at the tourism, but you have to just be very, very purposeful and you have to make sure you segment your marketing campaigns. Does that help? Absolutely. Yeah, so we, like some of the communities, they will do a specific family attraction. They'll talk, like Wilmer, Minnesota, they talked about their destination playground. One of the spouses is working, the other spouse has to be watching the kids and have a place to go. So absolutely we want to talk about Here's what it's like to live as a family, and then this is where you get back. And don't be afraid to talk about your faith community, the different religions you have. Talk about your culture. People want to know that because they're going to find it out either way. So don't be afraid. You know, I, 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 a lot of communities are like, well, people aren't going to come to us. Well, guess what? If they, don't, if, if they want to know what your culture is like, they're going to find it one way or the other. So give it to them. Give them in a nice, give it in your story and tell it the right way, which is positive. Talk about how your faith community or your volunteering community, your service organizations are helping other families grow in the things you're doing. Talk about that. One of the things that we'll see a lot of times when we put page statistics up is somebody will come in, they'll look at a job opening or they'll look at daycare, and then they immediately go to what are the volunteer opportunities? Because they want to know. How do I fill my time? Because the modern workforce, they're not going to be working 80 hours a week like my generation or 60 hours a week. They're, they're going to put their 40 in, and then they want to do something else. Or they're a telecommuter. They want to do something in the middle of the day because they're working till midnight. So give them, that, give them those op options. Don't be afraid to, to let that out. Did that help? Did I answer some of your stuff? OK, good. So one of the things that we find a lot of is just in general, the medical profession is growing so fast and recruiting young professionals to rural parts of the country is really hard. And a lot of times what we find is they just don't know, like Long Prairie, Minnesota, where I'm from, we just put up a new, or not where I'm from, but 30 miles away, they just put up a brand new hospital, a wellness center, great state-of-the-art facilities. They're trying to fill four doctor positions. They need to, and what we're helping them with and talking to them about is, 
your recruitment efforts have now got to be very aggressive and get in front of those med students, get to those places on the edge where those young medical professionals are, tell them about Long Prairie and why Long Prairie isn't just a, a community on the prairie, that it's in fact a very thriving medical community with opportunities for them to grow and learn in their profession. And too often what we see in, in rural uh, America about their medical is they have a hard time recruiting because they're not out there promoting their, I mean, they've done these great fundraisers and they put these great buildings up, they have these medical facilities with state of the art, but they're not recruiting. They don't have a high enough marketing budget. And so that's one of the things that we run into with rural health. Yeah, you're welcome. And let me take you there. So I don't know if we have the money. It doesn't matter. It's the, I, I come from a marketing background. It's the marketing. The, the reason they're not, they're not, they don't have to worry about paying that 20000 because now they have a message. Hey, if your community even is thinking about doing this, let's say your county uh, commissioners or your school board say, hey, we're looking at a program where we could offer $60. You start sending that out, it's going to start grabbing likes and shares. Just the fact that your community is that progressive and thinking about it, because not everybody's just thinking the money, they're thinking the opportunity. What a great way to start to run them. I mean, and that's one of the things that we look for in marketing is what are opportunities to go viral? What are opportunities to get the message out? It's more, because remember, on Twitter or Facebook, they're only reading the first 30 words. So if, you're, if your tweet and your marketing campaign goes out, hey, this community is looking at offering or this city council is adopting a resolution to help pay back student loans, read more here, that's what you want. Because now I've clicked on it, and now I'm reading more, and oh, by the way, their hospital has an opening. Oh, look, here's a house. That's what we're trying to do. We're just trying to get them in the door and then direct them coming back here to, are you looking at tourism? Are you looking at workforce attraction? That's what we're trying to do. Great.